to see all of you. Please open your Bibles to two passages in the Bible, Joshua, or Judges chapter 3 and Hebrews chapter 12. If you're visiting us this morning, welcome. We trust that you brought your Bible with. You're going to discover that at the base we love the written word, the hard copy of, of God's word. So um, if you're visiting us, if you feel out because you didn't bring your Bible next week, come visit us again. Bring your Bible with. There's people that died for this word to get into our hands. And what I've discovered is this, this app never seems to not open. Always opens. We on a, on a series that wasn't planned. The Lord is leading that way to just talk about faith. And so I want to encourage you, if this is the first time that you're getting into this series on faith, I want to ask you to go have a look or listen to the, to the YouTube Preachers on it because they tend to build on one another. And so if you're here this morning and you're just hearing this, you might say, oh, I don't know exactly what this is about, but I'm going to try my best to explain to you. Last week we spoke about the fact that you, we have to have faith in the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Very specific to understand that Jesus came as a man. He came to reveal us who God as a Father is. And the fact that it's the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ means it's not your Father of your past. It's not the Father of who have abused you or tried to raise you or did certain things that was harmful to you, but as the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, if you look at the Father of Jesus, you get to discover who your real spiritual Father is. And so Judges chapter 3, and turn one page back with me, Judges chapter 2, these things link in. I don't know if you know this, but the guys that wrote the New Testament didn't have the New Testament. They only had the Old and so what they would do is they would spend time in God's presence with God's Spirit and they would read the Old Testament with the understanding of what happened at the cross and they would use that to learn God's ways. They would learn, okay, these are the principles. These are some of the things that Jesus fulfilled, which means we never have to do those things again. You want to guess which those things were? Every sacrifice of blood in the Old Testament that the Israelites had to do to get right with God. All those sacrifices Jesus did away with. He says there's one superior sacrifice of blood, it's mine. It always gives you access to God. And so I want us to, to look at Judges chapter 2, and we're going to read together from verse 10. Because what you find in Judges chapter 2 is the principle that links with Hebrews chapter 12. And so let's read together. Hebrews... Or, Judges chapter 2, verse 10. It says, After the whole generation had been gathered to their fathers. Who's this whole generation? So the generation that led, that was living under Moses, now is the generation living under Joshua. That generation under Joshua's leadership. It says they're going to be with their fathers. It's a nice way to say they did. It says, After the whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. It's a sad thing when fathers are not present in homes to teach your children the way of God. Then you have this. They don't know God. They don't know how to walk with God. It says, Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God their fathers who had brought them out of Egypt, followed and worshipped various gods of the people around them. They provoked the Lord to anger. Because they forsook him and served Baal and the Asherahs. In his anger against Israel, the Lord handed them over to raiders who plundered them. He sold them to the enemies all around, and they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he had sworn to them. They were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them 
out of the hands of these raiders. Yet, they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshipped them. Like their fathers, they quickly turned from the way in which their fathers had walked. The way of obedience to the Lord's commands. You can underline that in your Bible. What's the way of the Lord? It's the way of obedience to His commands. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, He was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of the enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord had compassion on them as they groaned under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to the way to ways even more corrupt than those of their fathers. Following other gods and serving and worshipping them, they refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and said, Because this nation has violated the covenant that I laid down for their forefathers and has not listened to me, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations Joshua left when he died. I will use them to test Israel and see whether they will keep the way of the Lord and walk in it as their fathers did. The Lord had allowed those nations to remain. He did not drive them out at once by giving them into the hands of Joshua. In other words, if Joshua, or if the people were obedient, under Joshua, they would have cleaned the land from enemies. You okay? Catch the drift here? Catch the story here? Was God angry or was God caused to get angry? He was caused to get angry by what? By the people's disobedience. Listen to God, how strategic He is. God your Father. He says, these are the nations the Lord left to test all those Israelites who had not experienced any wars in Canaan. He did this only to teach warfare to the descendants of the Israelites who had not had previous battle experience. Underline that in your Bible. In mine, it's in inverted commas. It says, He did this only to teach warfare to the descendants of Israel who had no previous battle experience. What does God do in His anger? He devises a circumstance in which He wants to set His people up for victory. That's what God does in His anger. When you got, get God really angry, if it's possible, He says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put some stuff, I'm going to allow some stuff to teach you warfare and to teach you victory. Now let's turn to Hebrews 12. Because Hebrews 12 is a further explanation of Judges chapter 3. In Hebrews 12, you find most people think, Timothy, my conviction is a team of apostolic men is writing this letter to Jewish believers. And they're wanting to encourage these Jewish believers in the book of Hebrews to live a life of obedience, to live a life of faith. And so the whole book is full of encouragement. The whole book is full of warnings. Hebrews chapter 11 is the great faith chapter. And then we get to Hebrews chapter 12, which we don't preach about too often. But Hebrews 12 is a continuation out of Hebrews 11 because what these writers are doing, they're saying, listen, having looked at the faith of these men that has done incredible things in obedience with God, now let's just conclude the matter. Let's look at the faith of one man. His name is Jesus. And let's see what you can learn from him. And so Hebrews 12 one says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not be weary and lose heart. In Australia and sin, you've not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. Had you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses your sons? My son, what's the word of encouragement that you need to hold to? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you. 
Because the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. And do hardship as discipline. As discipline, God speaks to you as sons. Who's ever done that? We don't go hard. Yeehaw! We don't do that. Verse 7, and your hardship as, dis- as discipline, God is treating your sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you're not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits? Please underline that. If you believe in Jesus, God has become the father of your spirit. If you don't believe in Jesus, Satan is the father of your spirit. That's why you have to be born again. Born again is not a nice option on a Sunday morning. It's the reality of getting God as a father over your spirit. Verse 10, our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Is that true? I remember the days my dad used to call me to the bathroom with sip soap. It was not an exciting something to look forward to. It's like, how's this going to work? Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace. For those who've been trained by it. Please underline the word trained. It's describing the process. God is the father of your spirit, but now he has to train your soul. It's a training process. And hardships and sufferings and all these things that comes against you. It says it's not fun when it happens, but rejoice. Hold. Because your father is busy training you. Therefore... Strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather be healed. Make every effort, please underline. Who's going to make the effort? Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God, or us? Us. Make every effort to live in peace with all men. And to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God. Underline grace. Grace is so powerful. You must make every effort. How? By the empowering grace of the Holy Spirit. It's a hardship. You must just be willing. Say, Lord, I'm going to make effort. This thing in my life, I don't want it anymore. I don't want it. I bring it before you. I call it what is now Holy Spirit. The grace to empower me to live different comes from Him. Verse 15, See that, that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rice as the oldest son. Afterwards, you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. Father, that's a mouthful already. And therefore, I ask you this morning to help me to present the power of your word simply, clearly. And I ask for our ears to be open this morning to hear. I ask you for the heart of the hearers to, to be open to receive what it is that you're saying. We just praise you. We just bless you this morning, Lord. We honor your great name. Amen. So when we talk about this, this process of God the Father, this process he puts you in through, through hardship sometimes. Or you find yourself in hardship. That's a better way of saying it. You find yourself in hardships. You find yourself in suffering. You find yourself in pain. The book of Hebrews describes to you how you activate your faith to lay a hold of a father that has a process with your life. That process is to purify you. 
That process is to bring you into maturity. That process is to, is to help you with the right perspectives. And so these writers are, are saying, listen, when it comes to difficult times, who's had difficult times in your life of faith? Now oh, there's more. Okay. Sometimes following Jesus is just tough. What now? These writers are saying, there's a process. You need to know that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has a process with your life to mature your soul, to mature your thought life, to mature your heart, and to get you moving like a son of God. So where does God start? It starts off in verse 5. It says, do not, do not lose heart when he rebukes you. It paints God in a very harsh picture, doesn't it? You get rebuked, doesn't it? It's not nice. I mean, we all want to be pampered, but we all want to know. But what does it mean when it says that God the Father will rebuke you? Don't lose heart when He rebukes you. If you look at the meaning of the word rebuke, it means this. He tests or exposes what is in your heart. That's what it looks like when God the Father rebukes. He tests or exposes what is in your heart. And so when challenging circumstances find them in my life, or I'm, I'm forced to to endure certain things and there's hardships and I'm standing up for Jesus and nothing seems to work. As a matter of fact, it seems to lose control. I can't keep this thing together. Everything is running out of control. There's pain everywhere. He says, remember this. Here's the encouragement. God is using circumstance. Big, big question. He's not the cause of it. But he'll use it. Many of us See God as an enemy because we constantly say, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? Why have you caused this? And God is not culprit. What's the culprit? What opened the door to the suffering and to all the stuff that's happening in your life? Your own disobedience. Sometimes it's not even yours. It's generations before you that are disobedient that you have to deal with. Michael goes happy, Michael goes sad, Michael goes mad. Which one am I doing? And so when these difficulties come, Father says, okay. Yannis, I want to expose to you what's really in your heart. I have to get your motive sorted out. Difficult times, hardships, sufferings, even sometimes the pain of loss. It forces us to expose what's really in our heart. You know, let's travel to, to France last year. And the Lord organized it in these incredible ways for us to have an Airbnb for two nights. In Paris, with a French lady hosting us, giving us some of the French flair and helping us understand some of the movements. We're quite new to Airbnb in a foreign country. And as she walks in, she looks at us, she says, uh, Hey, I can see you guys haven't done Airbnb before. Eh? Like, no, 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 thank you so much for helping us. We were sitting and talking for two minutes, and she opened her heart to us. She said, I lost my fiancé three years ago, and I'm still not over him. Still heartbroken. I can't seem to get forward with my life. Now thinking, my goodness, there's a wide open door for the gospel. And I thought the Lord said, don't preach the gospel. Just help her understand what is busy happening. The sense of loss, the sense of death has now exposed her heart to what she really believes about death. What she really believes about Jesus. What she really believes of what Jesus did to death. See, if you believe that, with all of your heart, you'll go into pain, but you'll have an incredible hope. You'll be able to keep moving forward. But when this lady got confronted with sudden loss, traumatic loss, her heart got exposed. What do you truly believe about Jesus? The same for you and for me. When you find all things coming against you, God, Father, saying, my son, I want to show you what is really in your heart. Jesus qualifies you to go to heaven, but I'm out of your sword, and your soul needs a bit of an upgrade. These hardships wasn't caused by me, but I'm gladly going to use them for your benefit. That's exciting news. Are you as excited as I am? There's a little bit of hope on the left side of the church. You don't like suffering? Then they come. It's like, oh, Father, you are busy exposing what's in my heart. What is really the matter? What do I really hold within my heart? You know why it's important? Because the secret of the kingdom is the word of God and the condition of your heart. And so when hardships come, it's exposing what the condition is. 
I are in a place where you can trust God the Father. You can say, Father, I come before you. I trust you. Are you in the place where you say, oh, I just knew I couldn't trust you. It was just a matter of time. And so the process of purification is a process where God adjusts, the Father adjusts your attitude. You want to find out what your attitude is like? Go read Matthew chapter 5. It will explain to you the attitude that a son and a daughter of God should have, should walk with. And so hardships, difficulty, suffering is not God saying, ah, I'm going to burn you. I've been waiting for this. It's the Father saying, Yanis, you've left me no other choice. I have to expose your heart, my son, because I have to adjust your attitude. You think this gospel is all about me, 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 me. It's not, Yanis. This gospel is about my son, Jesus Christ. The gospel is about getting others to see him because I have the desire of the Father to have more sons added to my family. Is that your motive? Or are you coming to Jesus to bless me, to bless me, to bless me, to bless me, to bless me? Does he want to bless you? Does Jesus want to bless you? Does the Father want to bless you? Of course. Sometimes the blessings come through hardship because you have to upgrade your soul. But everything to do with your mouth. James chapter 3 says, the reason you're not getting your prayers answered is because of the wrong motives. The reason you're crying, crying, and Jesus, and Jesus' name, and Jesus' name, the reason that's not happening is because your motive's off. And so this process of suffering to be allowed into our lives, the Father says, I'm going to use that, my son. I want all your prayers answered. I'm going to teach you life of faith. So that the prayer of faith can work every time in your life. Maybe next time we'll look at life of faith and the prayer of faith. So in verse 6, ooh, it gets even more heavy. It says, in verse 6, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, he punishes. Hey! He punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Underline the word punish. And then right next to it, what does the word punish mean? means correct. Means to correct, to bring line. So how does God punish you? How does the Father punish you? He allows the circumstance that you create through disobedience. He says, Yanis, in those circumstances, I am going to bring you the truth about who I really am. I'm going to correct your mindset. Your mindset about me is wrong, my boy. And so in these moments where it's like everything has fallen to pieces, where am I at? What's happening? Father says, now hopefully you'll get to the place where you'll allow the truth about me to be carried in your mind. So do you believe that God is for you? Do you know that He's got an incredible future for you? Do you know that He wants to bless you? That He wants to prosper you? Do you think that? Mentally or in your heart? Is your faith activated towards that? Our Father is good, friends. You have to hear this. God, our Father, is good. He's the Father of light. He cannot send darkness. And so when He corrects us, He's bringing truth into our minds. Why? Because under the old master, we used to think of God as an enemy. Under Satan's fathering or fathership, we used to think of God as an enemy. He's holding back on me. He's just waiting to punish me. He's just waiting to sort me out. He's just waiting to slap me. He's just waiting. God, the Father says, no, 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 you don't get it. I want to correct you. I want you to have the truth of who I really am. And so this process through suffering, this process of disillusionment, this process of hardships, sometimes of pain, wasn't caused by God, but He will use it, your Father will use it to correct your view of who He is. Are we good? Verse 
Verse 11 says this. You can actually read from verse 9 because it's so, so powerful. It says, Moreover, we all have had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live, live, live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Amen. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace. Wow. Our God knows the end from the beginning. Our God speaks the things that are not as though they are. Our Father knows what is the outcome before you even start the process. So what is God the Father's outcome for your life? If you find yourself in this process of shaping, of pain, of disillusionment, of suffering, what is the Father's outcome? Why is this process engaged in your life? What does God the Father want to lead you into? Let's try the cheap seats on the left-hand side. What is God the Father preparing for you? What is He seeing at the end of this process? Cheap seats, please help me. A harvest of righteousness and a harvest of peace. Someone is excited about that. Let me explain a harvest to you. Because I see you're not farming folk. In the Western Transvaal, you'll put one millipip down into a soil that you trust the Lord for the rain and you leave it in there. That little millipip, you nurture. You try and look after it. Sometimes there's drought coming. Sometimes there's rain coming. Then you have to open the crust of earth so that this little seed can sprout through the ground. That's all the farmer's responsibility. Then this little seed pushes through the soil. And you will not guess it. It grows up to become a plant. And out of one millipip, if you're lucky in a good year, you'll have four cobs with millies on them. Get the picture? One produces a harvest of five, if you're lucky, millie cobs with thousands of millies on it. You get the concept of harvest? So can you see God's process with you, even through suffering that He didn't cause? He brought a solution. He says, don't you worry, Annas. I've got this harvest in mind for you. You one single seed. If you will simply die, I will produce a harvest with your life. You get the benefit of that righteousness. You get the benefit of that peace. Can you imagine what it must be to have the same righteousness as God? Can you imagine what it must feel like to have the same peace that God has in heaven, your Father? Imagine. He says, my boy, that's the aim. We're going there. You've got to get off to that harvest that's waiting for you. But my boy, some of your disobedience, some of your rebelliousness, some of your dependence and your pride, my boy, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to allow these circumstances because I want to get you to that harvest. You can't do it in this day. Yo, Yada, this is lucky by the What's the benefit of being righteous? What does it mean? I said this last week, I said this again. Please write in your notebooks. Righteousness equals access to the Father and access to everything the Father has. Please, that's what the word righteousness means. Righteous, to have the righteousness of Christ given to you means this. You've got access to God as a Father and you've got access to everything that He has. Now, last time I checked the Bible, the Bible says, 
God the Father is gloriously rich. Does your Bible say it? Hey, please, does your Bible say it? When you read your Bible, do you find that? He's gloriously rich. For you to have a harvest of righteousness means, oh my goodness, I know I can come to my Father. I know He's loaded. Father, this thing and this thing and that thing. The Father says, you just come, I'm going to help you. Sort you out. You see, righteousness, and we throw this around like a load. Oh, at the base we talk about righteousness, but we don't have a clue what it means. Hardship, suffering, difficulty. It just helps you to discover the fact that you can act as God in righteousness as a father. Your father. Then, if you can be with father and he can give you perspective, what's the first thing the Bible says he will give you? He'll give you peace. Hey. Father, the winds are blowing. The people are coming. What is this? The money is lacking. Have you discovered that the month of January is like having a whole year of 2024 in one month? Have you discovered that? Jeez, there's a lot of months and there's a lot of, not a lot of months. Is even that thing? Come to me. You feel the pinch? Come. You can come sit with me. I've got perspective. I've got resource. Come. Let's sit together. Let's plan the strategy. Can you see that God uses hardships to start to move you into maturity? When you know you're right with Him, when you know that you can live and rest, then you can start to rule. You can start to rule. I've got access to God. I'm seated with Him. I've got peace with him. He's got the answers I can hear from him. And I can go and execute. Why would God be excited about you and your harvest of righteousness, your harvest of peace, your harvest of rulership? Why would he be? Now why? Because he's teaching you to fight just like the Israelites in Judges chapter 3 so that you can get to taste victory. With your faith. Think of, think of this. Boop, boop. Over here. Think of this. Jesus destroyed the enemy at the cross. Colossians says he made a public spectacle of the enemy. Is that what your Bible says? Yerra, help me. Is that what your Bible says? He destroyed the enemy. But just like Joshua, God the Father says, don't chase all the enemies off the land. I'm going to use that to train my sons and daughters to live by faith, that they can know how to fight in spiritual warfare, that they can taste what sweet victory looks like when the enemy gets driven off the land. Why do you need deliverance from demons within your soul? Because Jesus defeated them already. And the Father saying, I want to activate your faith that you can get free. Drive them off this property. Why do we take the gospel out into your neighborhood? Because Satan has been feted, but he's not been driven out of your neighborhood yet. Why do we need the church relevant in South Africa? Because Jesus defeated the enemy as the church's great call and privilege to drive the enemy out of our borders. My friends, if that does not get you excited, doing this, you're under a spirit of slaughter thinking, Ah, oh, Yanas, I want to watch you do this. Jesus defeated every enemy and is waiting for your faith, for you to access righteousness, for you to access rest, for you to access rulership, and say, now I'm moving as a son of God, and when I go by faith, I'm going to drive the enemy out. Do you know why the enemy tries to get the church divided on doctrine? Because he's so afraid. He's so afraid that you access your, your, your father, you get perspective from your father, and that you can now go and everyone that's been defeated can now be driven out of Mulder's Drift, driven out of Kruger's Dorf, driven out of Joburg, driven out of, out of our country. And then there's nations waiting. With that same message. Mm. 
And then we get to verse 16. This is a fascinating verse. Verse 16 says, See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could not bring about, could bring about no change of mind, could find no space in his heart, though he sought the blessing with tears. Oh, why? Put Esau in there. Why? Paul, Timothy, John, why, why do you put that guy in there? You know why? Because Esau despised his birthright as a son. Let me explain. You know, Abraham had a son, Isaac. Isaac nearly died on the altar. Isaac had two boys, Esau, Jacob. Happy theologians? Esau was the oldest son. Because he came first out of his mother's birth canal, he's got the privilege and the rights of firstborn. Now, we've lost a little bit of our feel for that. But here's the thing with firstborn. Firstborn of a family got all the inheritance of the family. It's a big thing. Oma Ani, with her beautiful old table that you want to inherit, if you're the oldest son, guaranteed it's yours. The other family can wail and they can cry. Bad luck. You didn't come first. Happy? Esau had favor with his father. I said his father looked at Esau. He was a hunter. He used to shoot bow take bows. You know that thing one? He was a marksman. He could shoot and he could kill. His father was so proud of his boy. Jacob, on the other hand, you know Jacob? He was mommy's boy. He would hang around the tents and he would cook. He was a, the precursor to Jamie Oliver. He knew how to work with food and meat. And so Esau, the oldest boy, he just knew, oh my, I'm set for life. I have it, baby. Everything of this family is coming by my, my way. And here's the thing, my dad really adores me. Jacob, better you hang on to mommy's pants. You're not going to get much. But then one day, Esau went to the field. He hunted and he could find nothing. And so he came home famished, the story says. He looked at Esau and guess what? Jamie Oliver has got nothing on expensive food. Jacob says to Esau, listen, this is the best red stew you will ever, ever come across. But if you want to take a taste, you have to sell me your inheritance. Talk about expensive food. And so Esau looks at his need, he looks at his stomach, he looks at what he wants. He says, oh, you know what, I've got so much favor with my father. There you go. Take my birthright. Doesn't mean much to me. I've got favor. What you have to realize about Jacob, he says, he's a deceiver. But... He is a man that has a vision for what the Lord wants to do with his life. And so he accesses that by faith. Even though he's deceived, walking to the enemy camp with his deception. The Lord saw him out. You remember the story? Much later. But Jacob becomes the father of many nations. A man of faith. Even though his methods is dark. Tracking with me? And so the story continues that old Isaac got very old. It says his eyes grew dim. They realized, Ooh, Papa can no phone say bye-bye. He's not going to be around anymore. So quickly, quickly, Jacob made a plan to present the best stew that Esau would have made. And he tries and trick, and he's very successful at that. He tricks Isaac into blessing. Giving him the right of firstborn blessing. And his father is so, so set that he speaks all the blessings he can over Jacob. The story goes that, that the, the, the flavor of this incredible dish that, that, that Jacob served his father was still hanging in the air when Esau came from land and 
prepared a meal for his father. It's amazing. One meal sold him his inheritance. Another meal got him to miss the blessing. I want you to see this. When Esau realizes, oh my goodness, the blessing has been stolen. I've lost the blessing. What is Esau's response? It says that he got angry with his brother. He starts blaming his brother. He says, why did you steal it? It was never yours to be in the first place. But the problem with Esau is he relied on his favor. He never transferred it to faith. What does it mean for us? It means very simply this. You and I that believe in Jesus, you have favor with God as a father. Say amen. Amen. But that favor doesn't mean that you are busy living a life of faith. You are a son and a daughter of God. You have got the birthright that is registered in heaven. The day you say, I need Jesus, that day, heaven took your name and wrote your name. Yanis Labiskachni, the book of life. No one can ever pull that out. You are registered in heaven. Doesn't mean... That because you have that favor, you know how to live by faith with that birthright. And so what the father says, he says, my boy, I have got a massive inheritance for you. Don't despise your birthright. Come to me when pressure gets on. Come to me, my boy, and let me help you discover the blessing that is in your birthright. Don't tap out. Don't say, where is God? Don't say, oh, this is too much. Just say, father, I need more. I have to discover what you've given me. Now I've discovered you go after your birthright, discovering your birthright. Do you want to know? Cheap seats on the left hand side? Yes or no? Just my call. Just don't sit on the fence. You know how you discover your birthright? Father, I need you. Jesus, I humble myself before you. Lord, you oppose the proud, but you give grace to the humble. I humble myself before you, Father. My opinions, my pride, my rebellion, I just confess. I come, I ask for mercy, mercy, mercy. Mati karabashata masiki dimeri kiasanku kohorokos. Father, I come to you. I come to you. I come to you. I humble myself. I humble myself, Father. You have the answers. You see the pressure. You see all these things that come before you. God opposes the proud. God opposes the proud. But He gives grace to the humble. How low can you go? How low can you go? Our Father is using the difficult circumstance, the pressures, the misunderstandings, He's using it to get you into a position where you will humble yourself. Say, Father, I don't know the way forward. Whatever is in my heart, whatever is in my mind, whatever is keeping me from moving forward, I humble myself. I have nothing to say. Father. I don't know why the church is so powerless, friends. Because we carry so much pride. Oh, it doesn't suit me. Oh, I don't know about that. 
Oh, I will do, I will serve Jesus, but just do not ask me to do this. You know what was Esau's downfall? It's the entitlement of his heart. He had favor, he had access, he had everything going for him, but in his heart, he was entitled. How does this work for me? How does this suit me? How can I get benefit? How can I get the benefit of Jesus and just keep living my life? Because his heart was entitled. The Bible says a bitter root grew in his heart. And when you live with bitter roots, it comes out as a fruit. It's the fruit of blame. Why did the church not phone me? Why did the elders not do this? Why da da why da 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 why da da da? All you have is a heart of entitlement. There's a bitter root that's in there and it's coming out with a fruit of blaming everyone instead of saying, I'm humbling myself, Father. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Oh, but the, the pastor didn't phone me when I went in for the operation. It's amazing. The shocking leaders of this church. But listen, last time I checked, if you sick, you found the doctor. The doctor doesn't phone you. Oh, looking for another church. Instead of using the opportunity through misunderstanding, suffering. Father, I humble myself. What needs to move within me? So when you discover your birthright, your heart is full of gratitude. Whoa, I used to be a muhu, I used to be a sinner, I used to be a sabanger, I used to be useless, but because of the blood of Jesus, I'm registered in Him. I am forever grateful. Whatever is against me, let it come. My gratefulness with my Father is not going to move me. You see, when you live with a heart of gratitude, you plant trees or roots of forgiveness. The forgiveness tree flourishes and a heart full of gratitude. And it produced fruit. You know what that fruit looks like, sounds like? A life of praise and worship. Speak about the goodness of your Father. I worship Him. My body belongs to Him. I'm presenting my body. Father, what do you need? Where do you need me to go? What do you need me to do? Clean the toilets? Is that all, Father? Well, then, as you don't know that the sewage has been blocked for two weeks, so good luck, my brother. A heart gratitude is how you discover your birthright. Trees of forgiveness, to be quick, to ask God for forgiveness where you've accused Him, to love on others where you've, when you've abused them, and to love on yourself. Produces the fruit of praise and worship. Amen. It says... Verse 14, if you discover this birthright, if you discover that you belong to God the Father, Jesus is your brother, He's given you access. If you discover that, here's your response. You will make every effort. Please say that with me. Make every effort. Who's making the effort? Ha. Ah. Not God the Father, not God the Son, not God the Holy Spirit. We, you and I, make the effort. It means this, when you find these things in your heart, you have to be willing to say, Father, there's stuff in my heart I don't like. There's things in my mind I don't like. Father, I come, I make every effort. I am willing to submit these things to you. Please help me. All you need. Then these writers say, say, see to it that you do not miss the grace of God. Write in your Bible, write in your notes, what is the grace of God? The grace of God is the empowering help of the Holy Spirit. How do you make every effort? Very simple. Be willing. Be willing to say, Father, my heart, my mind, my motives, all those things skew. I come to you this morning. I make a declaration. I say, I repent. No more. Now the grace, the empowering help of the Holy Spirit. I need within my heart. I need within my mind. I need within my life of faith. Empower me. It's good news, friends. When 
times when things go against you, you've got only one response as a son and daughter of God. You fix your eyes on Jesus. So what do you do? The stuff that weighs you down, what are those things? It's the ungratefulness in your heart. Those things start to put a weight on you. Now you can't run your race of faith. You fix your eyes on Jesus and say, Jesus, my heart is turned ungrateful. I confess it and I repent. I do not want this ungrateful heart anymore. Holy Spirit helps. It says, watch out for the sin that easily entangles. What does the sin do? The disobedience, you're not loving others. You're not loving God. You're not loving the agreement that the Lord has made with your life. He says, cut those things off. How? By simply saying, Lord, my disobedience of not living in love is holding me back. The moment you're willing to bring those things in the light with the confession of your mouth, the Spirit will come. He will help you. Change your heart. Change your mind. Get you moving in the process of maturity. Are we good? Ask the band to come help us. Who's facing real challenging times right now? Please stand. Might be relational, might be financial, might be emotional, might be a whole host of things. Awesome. We're in safe space. We're at the church. You don't have to think, oh, what are they going to think if I respond? You're with family. You're going for the same home in heaven. Facing challenging times. Let me say this, you've got a bit of a faith crisis. I don't know if I trust God and I don't know if I've got faith to trust Him. So I want to help you just to apply what the scripture has said. You are willing, that's clear, you are standing. You've done the most difficult part actually already. For those that are still seated, I know it's difficult, but you have to respond. It is your faith that gets you moving. God has got it all. It's done. So what we're going to do first is we're going to deal with a weight that's sitting on you. That weight is preventing you from running your race of faith. How do you do that? You come to Jesus this morning and you confess the ungratefulness of your heart. I don't want you to think it. I want you to speak it. I want you to say, Jesus, it's true. This morning I've lost the blessing of birthright. I belong to God as a father. He will never leave me. will never forsake me. But I do confess, this morning I've lost my gratitude. And then just repent. Say, Lord, I choose to turn away. Repent of my entitlement this morning. I'm turning the grateful heart. You working all things for the good. Please don't think it. The enemy does not read your mind. He hears the confession of your lips. Then let's deal with the the sin that wants to hold you back. So you want to run for God, but you're disobeying Him. Confess it. Say, Father, I do not know whether I love you as my highest and first priority. Jesus, I don't know if I love you that way. Forgive me this morning. There's people that has caused you hurt, that has caused you disillusionment. Choose right now to forgive them. You be willing to do that. But your wife, choose to forgive her. It is yourself. You have been harming yourself. Just choose to forgive. Say, Lord, I choose to forgive myself. There you are. 
That's it. Wonderful. 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 The Holy Spirit, thank you that your grace enable every heart and every being here this morning. Let's receive now, friends. Just open your hands if you're comfortable that way. Just receive. Just receive. Just receive. I have just received. Keep your mind fixed on Jesus. Open your heart to the work of the Holy Spirit. That's it. That's it. Open your heart. Let him in. Give the burdens to him. Release to him. Just keep receiving. Just keep receiving. Release, you do not have right. Fire, Lord. Fire on this man. Jesus. Jesus. Bless you. 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 Bless in tears, Lord. He will reap with joy. Jesus. 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 It's present limitations, Lord. Remove the Jesus man. Stuff that's holding him back. Relationships, pressures. Jesus. The strategies, the strategies. Ask the Lord for wisdom, Lord. Ask the Lord for wisdom. New strategies, new strategies, new strategies. For even more, there's a great inheritance. Even more. I was going to ask the team to help us to serve the communion elements. It's the team that can help us hand out the juice and the bread. if you all would mind to stand. I don't think you would mind. Eh? These lazy boys do get uncomfortable after a little bit. Just get to receive your communion elements and just hold them. We're going to break bread together this morning. Wonderful sense of God's peace, isn't it? Wonderful sense of God. Friends, we've got a Father that loves us. We have a Father that is for us. I'm going to prophesy over you, 2024, there's certain enemies. God has left them so that you can teach, learn warfare and have victory. Hey, how good is He? He's sharing the spoils. You just have to activate your faith. Just activate your faith. 